Hello everyone and welcome to episode 56 of Mad Knitting. My name is Susan, my pronouns are she, her, hers, and you can find me elsewhere online as Madtown Mama on Ravelry and Madtown underscore Mama on Instagram. I spend a lot of time on Instagram, so if you want to get to know me better, other aspects of my life, you can follow me there. Um, today, by the way, is February 19, 2024. It's President's Day, so it's one of those obscure holidays that I actually have off. I work for a nonprofit and we get all these federal holidays off, uh, but nobody else does. So I have the house to myself. Um, I'm here alone with my thoughts and I've had a lot of thoughts today. So um, I thought I'd go ahead and record an episode, even though I don't have a whole lot finished to show you. I feel like I do have a lot to talk about. So today I have one finished object to share two works in progress that I've made enough progress I can talk about, some sewing and also some mending. So kind of a little of everything, a smorgasbord of crafting, if you will. So um, before I jump into the crafty stuff, I just wanted to say that because it's February, um, it is the February challenge on Instagram, which I always enjoy participating in that. So basically, um, they come up with a prompt for every single day in February and you can participate as much or as little as you like, but I think it's fun to try to come up with a photo and some kind of response to the prompt of the day. Um, even though I don't really feel pressure to post every day so far, I have posted every day this month. Um, and there have been a few different days where you know, I thought, oh, I'll just find a nice photo to respond to this prompt of whatever it is. Um, and then I end up thinking all of these other things that sort of go along with it. So today, for example, the prompt is project bag. And I thought, oh, I'll just pull out all the project bags that I'm using right now with active works in progress and post a picture because they look nice together because I made them all and I'm kind of proud of that. And then that got me going down the road of thinking, well, I shouldn't downplay the skills that it takes to make your own project bags. I mean, I don't think it's really that hard, but you know, you have to know how to cut and measure, well, measure then cut and sew and you know, what order of things to sew together and where to put the drawstrings and how to do it all. And like that takes, that takes some skill and practice. I don't know that I would say it takes some particular talent, but um, it's something not everybody has developed. Um, so like, I'm proud of that. I'm proud that I learned those skills as a child and young adult, mostly from my mom, but also through the 4-H program that she signed me up for when I was very young, about eight, nine years old. Um, and we shouldn't downplay it. We shouldn't downplay the skills that we've developed, um, especially, I think, when they are domestic skills that are really considered not so important because they tend to be the things that women do, right? Um, so I could go on and on about the patriarchy because I'm really kind of on that tear these days, but I think I'll spare you, get to the knitting content, the other crafting content. Um, but just wanna say, like, own your skills, you know? It takes practice to do those things and they are very useful. Like something as simple as sewing a button back on a shirt, like if you need your shirt buttoned, you better know how to sew that button on. And that's not like, it doesn't require some great artistry, but it takes some skill and a small amount of supplies. So, you know, if you know how to sew on a button, thank the person who taught you right? And if it's YouTube, be glad that there was somebody who, who was willing to make a video and show you on YouTube. Okay. Um, today I am wearing a shawl that I made, oh gosh, a while ago now. I can't remember how long ago. Um, it's a pattern by Hohi Locatelli. It's called the Alejandra shawl. I always want to call it Alexandria for some reason, but it's not. It's Alejandra. And, um, it's super duper warm, so I probably won't want to wear it all day because we're having unseasonably warm weather, even though it's February in Wisconsin. 
I live in Madison, by the way. I don't think I mentioned that. Um, but it's a pretty shawl and I decided to pull it out. So I used Jacob wool. That's a breed of sheep. And I bought it at our farmer's market several years ago. Um, there's a goat cheese and egg vendor, not goat eggs, obviously, because goats don't lay eggs, but they sell a lot of goat cheese and they also sometimes have eggs for sale. Um, and I guess this farm raises Jacob's sheep because sometimes they'll have skeins of yarn um, in various natural colors of Jacob wool that you can get. So I collected, looks like three colors, eventually decided that this shawl would be a good match. This shawl pattern would be a good use of those. Um, it's basically, you start with a garter, oh, I'll take it off and show you. You start with a garter tab and do a bunch of increases as you go. So it's mostly in garter stitch. My one complaint is that the there's this sort of weird bump bubble thing at the top and I it bugs me even though it doesn't really show when you're wearing it. That's my only real complaint about this. And I don't know if it was my gauge or if it was something about the pattern. Um, but you can see it's garter. It's pretty long, which I like. Kind of long and narrow so I can wear it more or less like a scarf. And then when you get to the edge, there's this really fun mosaic pattern. So this is created with slip stitches. Um, it's color work done with slip stitches. So you're only using one yarn as you go across, but you're slipping some of the stitches and knitting other stitches. So you end with this color work pattern. Anyway, um, I think I had to do a modification on the edge because it wanted to curl up. Um, this mosaic pattern is in, it's not garter mosaic, it's stockinette. So when I did just the plain garter edge that it called for, it wanted to roll up. So I added, I sort of did a modified ribbing as I got to the last few rows. I don't know how well you can see. But between that and blocking, it seemed to solve the problem. This thing is so long that I could sort of, if I wanted, tie it around my waist kind of like they do in Little Women. But I prefer to just sort of drape it awkwardly like so. Oh boy, this is not. Okay, maybe I will cut some of this out or maybe you can see me struggle with styling it. Maybe this is why I don't wear it so much because it's kind of hard to get the, get it to, get it to lie right where I'm not constantly messing with it. Okay, I only have one finished object to show you. I in fact considered delaying making this video until I had more things finished, but changed my mind because A, I have the day off and it's a good time to do it. And B, because this isn't about just always showing you a parade of finished things. It's about talking about my process and the progress that I'm making. So I actually filmed a clip a few days ago when I finished this item because I was gonna give it to the recipient right away and I will insert that here. Hi, this is past Susan here to talk about a pair of socks that I just finished um, and I wanna go ahead and give them away. So I'm recording a quick segment here to talk about them before I give them away. Today is Thursday, February 15 and um, I have a pair of socks complete and ready to give to my son. This is part of the project to knit him a half a dozen new pairs of socks before he leaves for college this coming fall. I should have a name for that, like the college sock project. I don't like that. That doesn't roll off the tongue. We'll see if I come up with something else. But regardless, um, it's winter and he could use them now. So I'm gonna go ahead and give them to him. This is my own pattern, if you even want to call it that. Just my own method of making socks. I'm using, um, for all of the socks in this particular run, I'm using Knit Picks Hawthorne Fingering Weight. Um, he really likes the, the pair that I made him out of Hawthorne for Christmas. So when it was on sale in January, we picked out a bunch more colors that I ordered and that's what I'll be using for the next little while for socks for him. 
This is all I have left of it. This little bit. I haven't weighed it, but it cannot be very much. It's enough to keep, but I'm glad I didn't make the socks any bigger or I might've run out. This is the color Macadam, Macadam, Macadam. I'm not sure how to say it. Um, and it's a mix of like grays and teals. And I really like how it came out in the socks. So I cast on, for his foot, I have figured out exactly what fits. I use size one and a half needles, which I think is 2.5 millimeter. I cast on 68 stitches. The length of the legs of these socks varies somewhat. This is slightly longer than I have made him before. Um, and I have figured out that for the foot, once I'm done with the gusset decreases, if I do 50 rounds exactly before the toe decreases, that works out perfectly for his foot. Now I want to talk about the heel a little bit. In my last episode, I kind of rambled on and on about heel math and I probably confused those of you who actually made it through. <laughs> um, but I just, I want to share just a little bit about my thinking behind this. Um, normally, my preferred heel is Eye of Partridge, and that's where you're alternating your slips as you go down the, the slip stitches portion of the heel flap. Um, for Eye of Partridge, normally you are slipping, you're alternating which stitches you slip, so you end up with this like checkerboard effect of slip stitches. I didn't want to do that for these socks because I chose to do a one by one garter rib for the main stitch pattern, which basically means, um, so I did one by one rib for the cuff, and then when I got to the leg, I would do one by one rib alternated with a round of just knitting. So then when I got to the heel, I really wanted that line of knit stitches to continue all the way down the heel. Now, because the socks have an even number of stitches and the stitch pattern repeat is only two stitches, um, no, let me try that again. <laughs> I need an odd number of stitches across the heel in order to make everything very centered and symmetrical. If the heel stitches are an even number of stitches, I'm going to start with a knit and end with a purl or start with a purl and end with a knit. And there's no way around that unless I have an odd number of stitches for the heel flap. And because I cast on 68 stitches. If I divide them exactly in half for the heel, I still have an even number of stitches for the heel, 34. I did not want that. I, even though nobody else would notice or even care except for me, um, I'm the one knitting these socks. So I did this tiny alteration to my normal um, method and I worked the heel across 35 stitches. Um, so what I did was I did my normal, um, can you see? I don't know if it's how well it's showing up, but I, I have a garter ridge of two stitches on either side of the heel. Um, I always do that because it makes it really easy to pick up those stitches for the gusset. Um, it's easy to see exactly where to do it and it's just nice and tight. There's no holes when you do it that way. So that still left an odd number of stitches in the middle and when I was slipping every other one, I was able to start and end with a knit stitch for that flap. So that meant then when I was done with the gusset decreases, I had 35 stitches across the bottom of the foot and 33 stitches across the top of the foot. This also centers, by the way, that garter rib on the top of the foot. Um, again, not that anybody would notice except me, but I find it very satisfying when I can keep everything very symmetrical and centered. So the other thing I did to account for the slight, you know, it's still 68 stitches around the foot in total. So the foot's going to fit just the same as all of his other socks. Um, but in order to keep that centeredness and symmetry, once I got to the toe decreases, I decreased first just on the bottom on either side of the toe. So it went from 35 stitches to 33, and then my stitch count on the bottom of the foot matched the stitch count on the top, 33 and 33. And I just 
decreased at the same rate then, you know, up until I was ready to just knit two together all the way across and pull the yarn through, which is how I do toes because um, it's a lot easier than grafting and I think it fits just fine. So that's how I made these socks. I can now give them to my son as a finished pair. And that means that I have two out of six done already. So I can knit something else or knit different socks for somebody else for a little while. All right, back to the episode. Okay, before I get into works in progress, I wanna just show you, um, I don't know still exactly what to call this project of making socks for my son. The college sock project is awkward. We're not gonna call it that. Socks for college. Maybe we'll call it socks for college. Anyway, um, I had my son pick out the next color to use. And he picked this one, which kind of surprised me. This is also Knit Picks Hawthorne Fingering, and it's the color Slab Town. And he picked it because he said, oh, I don't have anything that color. I don't have socks that color. So there's just, you know, there's just a little more going on here than any of the other socks I've made him recently. It's, in aggregate, I think if you kind of stand back, it sort of reads brown, but when you look at it closely, it's mostly purples like mostly really muted purples mixed with tan. And it's fair, It's a fairly busy colorway. Um, I can show you the label. It doesn't, this just says Hawthorne fingering weight. It doesn't say if it's like hand painted or kettle dyed or whatever the different um, dye techniques are. But I will definitely be doing another plain stitch pattern. Maybe that one by one garter rib because I really like the look of that. Um, or I could do the two by two garter rib. It doesn't really matter, but I'm not gonna do anything elaborate because I want it to go quickly and because anything more patterned than that will really compete with the, the variegation in the yarn. So that's what's next. Okay, I only have two knitting works in progress to show you because, I don't know, I've just been really focused on working on them and everything is using like teeny weeny skinny weeny little yarn, so it takes forever but I enjoy that. I like how the fabric feels when you're working with fingering weight yarn and I, uh, you know, I like how it feels to knit. So that's, that's what I've been doing. So the first work in progress, I'm so close y'all. In fact, I thought about trying to finish this pair of socks just so I would have two finished things to show you for the video. But again, this is not about the parade of finished project. So this is at least the third time that I've showed you this project. So next time they will be done. These are socks for my father-in-law for his birthday, which is coming up soon in just a couple of weeks. So I need to get them finished and sent off. And I stopped this morning on the second sock just before the toe decrease. Um, wait a minute. Did I go too far? No, I didn't. Brain fart. So, um, yeah, <laughs> this marker shows two rows before I needed to start the toe crease decrease and that's the next part. So that'll go really, really fast. Um, I don't use a pattern. I just, this is kind of my general recipe. Speaking of skills, by the way, I've been knitting socks for over 20 years since my friend in grad school taught me way back in 2002. And I have this skill down so much that I almost never use a pattern. I guess if I want like a pattern sock, I would, but I just know how to do it. And that's a skill. That's something to be proud of. Anyway, um, the yarn is Utopia Wisco Sock. Uh, don't know the colorway because I've lost the label, but it's a beautiful espresso dark chocolate brown color um, for my father-in-law whose foot size is about like a men's size nine, about the same as my husband. Um, I use size one needles. I cast on 72 stitches. I do a two by two rib cuff and then I'm just doing plain stockinette because it's so nice and smooth and it goes really fast. 
I do an eye of partridge heel, which is my usually my preferred heel technique. So it's slip stitches, but you're alternating every other one. So it shows up in this checkerboard pattern. Um, I always edge the eye of partridge heel with three garter stitch ridge, and then just make my way down to the toe. And the stitch markers are here just to mark every 20 rounds plus whatever leftover there might be so that it makes it easier to keep track of making the second sock exactly the same as I'm knitting it. So I think that's all I'll say about that because lather, rinse, repeat. I do so many socks this way and I've talked about this before. Um, Y'all are going to get me tired of saying, get tired of me saying it. <laughs> so that's my first work in progress. My second one I've also showed here before. I'm trying to like finish things and not just let all the new cast ons pile up. Um, this is the sweater for my niece who also has a birthday. We have three family birthdays in March. My father-in-law is early March. My husband is in the middle of March. And my older niece um, is the first, is March 20. So it's sometimes it's the first day of spring. Um, and I don't always knit everybody something every year, but it adds up. <laughs> anyway, it's fine. They're all extremely knit worthy people. So this is the Little A Bloom sweater. It's a pattern by Jessica McDonald. And you can see I'm about at the end of my skein of yarn. Um, I have it, I still haven't steam blocked this color work at the top, but because I'm further on in the body, I think you have a better idea of how this sweater will look. I think it's really cute. I love this pattern, this floral pattern at the top. Jessica McDonald is a beautiful designer. Um, she does lots of stuff with color work, especially. She has some patterns with like cables and other texture that's the feature, um, but color work is really, really where it's at for her. Um, and my only, yeah, I used um, super wash yarn for this and I don't, love how it feels to knit color work and super wash yarn. And I'm almost at the point where I'm just not going to do that anymore, but never say never. Right. Anyway, I think it, it's, you know, it's, it's looking a little wrinkly and it'll definitely block out to look much smoother. Um, I think I said this before, but my issue mainly with super wash is that because it is treated not to felt, so it won't stick to itself when you wash it. It also means that when you do color work, where you want those stitches to like kind of uh, be snug together and maybe blend a little, they're not going to. They're just, they're gonna slip around. They're, they're gonna look a little too distinct, um, but that's okay. It's a kid's sweater and I wanted it to be washable. Now, um, I have done a couple of modifications to the top to, um, to make sure that the neckline is not too wide. It looks really wide in some of the other projects people have made. So I cast on fewer stitches, did the ribbing, then I'd increased. I also added short rows to the back of the neck. I think you can see that better now that I have more of the sweater knit. You can see there's some short rows here and then I added another set of short rows at the bottom of the yoke, just because I want it to, to the back neck to raise up a little bit. But so far, I think it's looking pretty good. Now, the yarn I'm using, here, I'll show you a unused skein. It is called Perlina, and it's from Le, Le Fibre Nobili by Filatura Servinia. I know that sounded very American, but I did my best. I think this is discontinued. I know I bought this a couple of years ago from Webs on clearance um, to add to my collection of yarn suitable to knit things for my nieces. And I thought I better use this before they both grow so big that this isn't enough to make them sweaters out of. Um, sure enough, where I'm at now, I have, this much left of the second skein 
And this second skein, I started like right after the R, right after the sleeve divide. So yeah, one skein of this, and I'm not doing any shaping or increases or decreases. It's just going to be straight down the body. One skein gets me however much this is of the body. And I have exactly two more skeins of the purple, of this lavender color. Um, so I got this on clearance. It's not available anymore. I'm not going to try to look for more. I'm going to make it work with what I have left. So if I use up a whole other skein on the body, I'll have to check and see what the pattern says. My niece is kind of tall, um, but this might be about right. And then I would have one left for the sleeves. One skein is definitely not gonna be enough for long sleeves, but I think that's okay. What I might do is take this remaining skein when it's time for the sleeves and weigh it and wind off half of it so I know exactly how much I've got for each sleeve and just adapt it to be short sleeve or elbow length or however it comes out. I do have a fair amount left of the contrast color. I haven't weighed this, but I'm, I don't think I even used half of it, maybe a quarter of it um, to do the color work. So I don't love the idea of like adding stripes in, but I could. I also thought about using this just to do the ribbing at the bottom and on the sleeve cuffs, just to make all the yarn stretch out a little further. And I think that would look okay. So that's a yarn management issue, um, but it'll feel good to have it all used up. Like I don't want tons of this left over. Um, yeah, so that's what I have in progress. I really wanna have it done by her birthday. Um, and it's such lightweight. I mean, this is, there's like 250 yards for 50 grams. This is really, really light. Um, I'm using size three needles and I'm getting seven and a half stitches per inch on size three needles. So it's taking forever, but I really like the fabric it's creating. And also I think it'll be good for a child who lives in a warmer climate than I do. They live in Virginia who, you know, I think her sister in particular tends to run hot and never wants like a jacket or sweater or anything, but she often doesn't either. So, so this, hopefully it'll be more wearable than if I was making like a really thick, bulky, cabled wool jacket, you know, that wouldn't get as much wear. Okay, those are the only <laughs> things in progress or finish that I have to show you, but I wanted to talk a bit about some mending, some that I've done and some that I have coming up. Um, now, I made this sweater for my son. I honestly can't remember if it was one year ago or two years ago. I think it was a year ago, about exactly a year ago. I made this sweater. Um, he doesn't wear it terribly often. He says he's not a sweater guy. I don't think he needs the warmth of a wool sweater but he does tend to wear it if he's not feeling well. And he's also worn it on, uh, <laughs> he had a school camping trip last fall and it was like, it was in October, but it actually got really cold and snowed overnight. And this kept him nice and warm in the tent. I mean, they didn't cancel the trip. You go, you learn how to deal with it. Um, anyway, he was wearing this for several days in a row when he wasn't feeling well and kept sneezing on it, which I know is gross, but he said, mom, how do I wash this? <laughs> he didn't want to put it back on after having sneezed on it a bunch. Um, so I showed him how to hand wash a sweater. I mean, it's really simple, but he'd never done it before. Again, with the skills, right? Um, so I just, I showed him how I, you know, I take, I think it was soak wool wash, put a little bit in a dish pan that we have you know, fill it with lukewarm water and just set it in there to soak for a little while. That's all you do. But as we were doing that, we realized that there were holes in this sweater. There were a couple of holes in the bottom, in the ribbing, and there was another hole in the back and like in the middle of the back, like here's the back of the sweater and the hole was here. Um, and I think it might've been moth damage 
it looked like moth damage. It looked like something had gotten in there and chomped. And, you know, honestly, it's not that surprising since this lives in a dark dresser drawer and he doesn't pull it out to wear that often. I can totally see how moths would get in there and have it have themselves a little snack. Well, he was somewhat distressed because he didn't want holes in his sweater. So I said I would fix it. And what I did was, um, and I pl had plenty of this yarn left, fortunately. So I just redid the ribbing. Um, I cut it off, took most of it out. Um, you know, I haven't reblocked it since, so you can kind of maybe see. Can you kind of see? It was like maybe from here down. This is a top-down sweater, so um, I was not willing to re-knit the entire body, especially since there's this pocket situation. Um, but the ribbing, it was easier to re-knit that than try to patch it and repair it because the holes were just too... There were too many of them and it was just a mess. Um, but the hole in the middle, I definitely was not going to re-knit all of that. So I found a tutorial on YouTube. Um, I can't remember. It was this a while ago, so I can't remember the name of it, but I will make sure I have something on the bottom of the screen and include the link in the description box below here. Um, but it was brilliant. Like, it wasn't just the kind of patching where you, like, weave together so it looks like a woven patch. Um, the person in this video, like, I actually took footage of myself trying this, but it is kind of bad, so I may not include it. Um, but she somehow like had yarn in a darning needle and made like a bunch of horizontal sort of long, um, you know, long pieces of yarn over the hole going horizontally and then like wove in the ends to secure them. And then got a crochet hook and use those horizontal um, threads <laughs> to um, like use it just basically to pick up stitches and then kind of did a grafting at the bottom with the rest of the stitches. I don't know if that explains it, but if you watch the video, it doesn't even take that long. And I mean, in the video that I watched, the end result, you could not tell it was patched. It looked absolutely seamless. My work is not exactly seamless. You can see it's a little lumpy there. Um, yeah, you can see that it's a little lumpy there. I, I did, I had to try it about two, maybe three times. And I'm not exactly sure I'm sure with practice I would get better, but he's pretty happy with it. If you're enough distance away, I don't think you would notice it. Um, and anyway, there's not a hole in the middle of his sweater anymore. It's mended. So that's good news. Um, and I told him that he should make sure his sweater is clean when he puts it away. <laughs> so we'll probably wash it again before summer uh, because it'll be, you know, put away for a while and we don't, we don't want those little fuckers to find it again. Um, right. So while I'm on this mending jag, I just, I thought I'd show you two more projects that I need to mend that I haven't gotten around to because I, I just haven't, but I should. So what is a pair of mittens? Y'all remember when, uh, when Joe Biden was inaugurated and there was that picture of Bernie Sanders that went viral because he's such a grumpy old man. Bernie really is a grumpy old man. He was just like sitting on the bleachers in his old parka and, you know, these mitten, like these recycled mittens and he's like got his arms crossed and he just looks really pissed off. Um, and the mittens went viral and everybody was making mittens that look like Bernie mittens and somebody came out with a sweater and blah, blah, blah. Well, I totally got on that same mitten kick and I made some mittens. <laughs> I made a pair for well, I made this pair for my son, but they came out small. So I just made a second pair a little bigger for him. And this pair for me, I shouldn't have kept wearing them once I found the hole, but I did anyway. So the hole's gotten bigger. I don't think this is moth damage. I think this is a case of 
the um, the thumb construction wasn't super detailed. Like there's not a nice gusset situation. So I think it strains a little bit, especially if you're riding a bike as I often do or shoveling snow or any of those things. Um, I think it's just kind of a weak point and the yarn is beautiful, but it's wool and spun and not very strong. And I think something snapped and it's just got this hole. So I need to go into my stash and see if I have any of this yarn left over. I'm not sure if I do. I'll, I can find something similar color um, and figure out how to patch this up because it's it's a pretty big hole and it's going to have to be a pretty big mending job in order to actually you know, make this nice and secure. So I should do that. And it's, it's been like this for a while. I just haven't gotten around to it because sometimes I'd rather just make another pair of mittens than fix the ones I have. <laughs> the other pair, and I'm sad about these. I made these socks. I don't remember. I made these socks for myself. I don't remember how long ago it was. A year or two? These are not that old. I have socks that I've had for like 10 years that are starting to get a little thin, but are still going pretty strong. These I've not had that long, but I put them on one day and I kept thinking I was stepping on something on the floor cause something didn't feel right. And then when I checked, I saw that there was this hole in the bottom, which is very disappointing. And again, I don't, I don't know if this is a moth hole. I can't imagine there's moths getting in my sock drawer because I open it all the time. I wear stuff all the, like it just, probably not. Um, but you know, that's pretty significant. I'll have to dig through and see if I have more of this yarn. I'm pretty sure this is a discontinued yarn by Rowan. Um, and what the thing I really, really like about these socks is that there is mohair in the mix. It's like a wool mohair nylon. So you can see there's that halo, that mohair halo, and it means they're a little bit extra warm. Um, I'm not sensitive to mohair. I can easily wear it near my neck and on my feet and everything. So I really liked these socks and I'm very bummed that there's a hole. So now that I'm looking at it, I could, if I find more of this yarn, I could just pull out the toe and re-knit it. That would be a possibility. Um, if I can find leftovers and if I had enough. Um, or I could try that same patching method that I did on my son's sweater. I'd have to rewatch that tutorial to be reminded how that works. But that's another possibility too. And that would work even if I don't have more of this yarn. If I found something a similar color or even a different color, who cares? It's the bottom of a sock, then I could fix it. But anyway, um, the socks otherwise aren't worn out enough that I think it's worth saving. When I get holes in the bottom of my socks, usually it's just because I've worn them so long that there's no fiber left and they're just threadbare and it's not worth keeping them. But in this case, I think it would be. So that's my mending chat for today. Now I'd like to talk about some sewing projects. Um, I did an episode where I talked about my sewing projects sometime earlier this year. I don't remember which one. Um, but I was all gung-ho. I had all this momentum. And then um, I may have mentioned that in the middle of January, I spent a week in Kentucky to um, just help support my parents because my mom had knee replacement and, you know, she's still recovering from that. It's, it's a long recovery. There's a lot of physical therapy and building up strength before she can drive again and stuff. But anyway, so I was there. And right before I left, I decided to take my sewing machine in to be serviced, you know, just like regular maintenance. They clean it out and make sure everything's working. Um, and usually that only takes a week. For whatever reason, the shop I go to, it's a local place called The Electric Needle. It's great. I love them. They have really good service. Um, but they had a whole lot of machines in for service and it was like a three week wait before I got it back. Um, which was kind of a long wait when I was really eager to finish some projects. Um, so I haven't made a lot of progress. I actually have made no progress on the quilt I showed you, but I, that's coming soon. But 
I also showed in whatever episode that was some placemats that I had started and I have finished some of them. So I'm going to show you what I've got. So the backstory is that we have some placemats that we use. Um, I think they were a wedding present. My husband and I have been married like more than 20 years. So even though these placemats have not been in use for 20 years, they're old and we've used them enough that they're stained, they're starting to get ratty. It's time for some, some fresh ones. So uh, my mom sent me some leftover fabric scraps from another quilting project she had been working on. They were, ev I, most of them were already cut into squares. All I had to do was put the squares together and sew them up. Um, so this is back in the very early days of the pandemic. We were stuck at home, we were losing our minds, and I thought, hey, I can make some placemats. Um, so I sewed squares together, put it away, didn't pick it up again until now, nearly four years later. So I'm finally finished with some of them. So these are really simple patchwork placemats. Um, I didn't want to buy anything for them because I'm trying to use trying to use up the stuff that I have, you know, as you do. I had a whole bunch of this navy linen or it might just be linen blend that I used for the back. And you can see that I did plain stitching, vertical lines, these, they, those just follow the, it's stitching in the ditch is what you call it. It's just following the seam line here. Um, and I actually started in the middle and went out so nothing would bunch up. And then I, uh, so I did all that before I dropped my machine off. When I finally got it back, um, now I was, yesterday I was able to do some binding. So I did the binding. And for the binding, I used, I'm just gonna like hold these different ones up. For some of them, I had long strips of the blue left, so I used that. I had this light blue as a scrap. I don't know what it was for originally, but I used that until it was gone. Um, when you sew the binding together, it works best if you can turn them at a 90 degree angle, sew diagonally, and then you get this nice, uh, I don't know if this is showing, you get, you get this nice edge and you don't have all the seam bulking up all in the same place as if you just sewed them, um, which I had to do on one of these. Yeah, like if you sew them just edge to edge like this, you get a lot of bulk right there, which I don't think you can see it, but you can feel it if you if you were touching this. Um, but yeah, we have four of these now. I have three more unfinished ones, and I would like to go through the scraps of this fabric that is still uncut and see if I can put together enough for an eighth placemat so that we have two complete sets of four. We're a family of four, and if we each, um, if there are eight placemats, then we can always have one set that can get dirty and be put in the wash and use the other set. So um, that's that's my plan. Now, if you're not familiar with how this process works, I just wanna talk for a bit about the binding. Um, so I cut, I, I cut it on the grain, not on the bias. I cut a two inch wide strip as long as I can. As you can see, sometimes I have to piece it together. Um, and for this, what I did was so, so, okay, so you have your two inch strip, fold it in half and press it. So you have raw edges on one side and a fold on the other. And then you sew, I sewed it to the back with a quarter inch seam. Um, I am not real great at turning the corners. I should probably figure out how to do a mitered corner a little neater, but for now I just did my best to make it work because I just wanted these to be done. Done is better than perfect in the case of placemats. Um, and then I took that folded edge, folded it over to the front and I zigzagged, zigzagged it down. Normally, like if you're doing a quilt binding, you would sew the binding down to the right side, fold it over to the back and hand stitch it, um, hand stitch it to the back. 
that's how I would do it. The advantage to that is that you don't have all that visible stitching. Um, it's in, You can sew it so that the thread is invisible. It's a much neater finish, but that takes a while. And um, in the case of placemats, these are gonna be used a lot. They're gonna be laundered pretty frequently, way more frequently than you would wash a quilt. Um, so the extra reinforcement of that zigzag stitch was important to me. Even if it doesn't look quite as refined, um, I think they're just gonna hold up a lot longer than if I hand stitch them. So I would do the same if I was making like pot holders or you know, anything else that gets like a lot of heavy use. So I'm pretty proud of these and we can start using them. In fact, we have already and they're not dirty yet. Doesn't take long. Doesn't take long for us to get these things dirty. I've got one future sewing project that I want to talk to you about. Um, normally, I don't share a lot about future sewing projects because I never know when I'm going to get to them. But this one's pretty special and there's a reason I need to talk about it first because it's going to require some deconstruction. So there's a whole story here. Um, the long and short of it is that my mother-in-law has requested that I make something for her, which she has never done before. And I am so thrilled that she asked. We were there over the holidays. As I have mentioned before, we were visiting my in-laws who are all in North Carolina. And while we were there, I mentioned that I was knitting a sweater for my mom and that my mom had actually requested it. Uh, so this is the Selena sweater that I've shared before. Um, and my mother-in-law, when she heard that, she worked up the courage. Apparently she's been wanting to ask me this for a while, but didn't have the courage. And when she heard that my mom had requested something and that I was happy to knit something for my mom, she decided to go ahead and request something of me. Now, I want to issue a couple of caveats here before I get into the project that I'm going to be doing. I make a lot of stuff for other people. If you've been watching me for a while or if you walk, follow me on Instagram, you know this. It's tempting to credit myself with being such a generous person. <laughs> I do want to be generous, but you need to understand also that there are a couple of things going on here. First of all, I have years and years of experience, especially with knitting, but also with sewing and making things in general. So, um, I have skills, I have supplies <laughs> out the wazoo. Like it is not a great sacrifice on my part um, to, to make something for nobody, yeah, to, to make something for other people. Um, it's also extremely rare that I get a request. Um, I know that some people have the issue of like people asking them inappropriately to make them stuff I'm sorry if that happens to you. You can say no. No is a complete sentence, in fact. You don't have to like couch it in an apology for why you don't have time or why it's not gonna work for you. You can just say no. I'm lucky that that's, that doesn't happen to me. Um, I occasionally, like my mom asked me to make her a sweater, it's totally fine. My mom taught me how to knit. Of course she can ask me to make her a sweater. Um, yeah, it's just, if you're in my family or in my close circle of friends and you ask me to make you something, most likely my answer is gonna be yes. And I never say yes to things that I don't wanna make. The other thing to know is that because I've been doing this for a long time and because I spend a lot of time doing it, like I can knit during meetings at work, like I've integrated this into other aspects of my life so much that I have accumulated quite a good collection of things that I have made for myself already. Sweaters, hats, socks. I should make myself more mittens, but shawls, even though I don't wear shawls all that often, that it is not a great imposition on me to make stuff for other people. It's not like it's taking away from my own wardrobe, you know? Like, and also I have a pretty big stash. If I used all of it just to make things for me, I, there wouldn't be room for all of it. I wouldn't be able to wear all of it or use all of it. So it's like mutually beneficial is what I'm saying. Okay. So what my mother-in-law asked for, this is unusual. 
is that she wants me to make her an apron or several aprons actually. But the story is that she has these aprons that she inherited from her own mother and her mother, her own mother lived to be 92 or 93 and she died, I think a few days before Obama was elected the first time. So it's been a while now. Um, and my mother-in-law, and God knows how old this is. This this is the prototype. This is what I need to, to copy from. But she really, really likes these aprons she got from her mother. Um, and they're all wearing out and she needs new ones. And she has shopped for others, but has not been able to find anything on the market that meets her specifications. Uh, my mother-in-law is very choosy about what she wears. I think all of us are to some extent. You know, you're picky about what colors you like, what style you like, what fit you like. And she wears her aprons all the time because she works a lot in the kitchen. And she's very particular about what she wants in an apron and not ha being able to find anything to buy. And she herself is not, not a crafty person. Um, my mother-in-law, just that's just hand work, craft work, that's just not her thing. Um, I think she had to sew out of necessity when she was growing up because that generation of girls didn't have a choice, um, especially where she was, but it's not something she enjoys and she'd much rather ask me to do it. And I was thrilled. Anyway, so this is it. So this is the one she likes the best and she gave it to me. You can see how thin it is and threadbare. And I'm gonna show you like I show you the guts of it because she said her mother was not a great seamstress herself. You know, I don't, you know, her mother sewed out of necessity and cooked out of necessity, and I don't think she enjoyed any of it, which is kind of sad. Kind of sad when you're forced to do all these things that you don't like and get no appreciation for. So, um, in fact, like the strap isn't even bothered just. They didn't even bother to sew it on. It's just pinned on with a safety pin. So what I need to do is take this apart very carefully and use this as a pattern. I may trace it out of preservation, you know, just to make sure I have like a copy, but I could use the fabric itself as a pattern, I think, or the, you know, the pieces of the apron. Um, what she likes about this that she can't find to buy is the back especially. So it's like a pinafore style apron, but every she said everything she's found like crosses in the back and she doesn't like that. Um, whereas this is just, you know, looks like this. Um, but yeah, she likes the way it fits. She likes having pockets. Uh, there's an extra safety pin here. I have no idea why. She doesn't really care about the trim or the rickrack. I think it's it's the, the shape and the fit. So my job is to make a bunch of these for her. Because like all the ones she have are wearing out. All the ones she has are wearing out. Now, she also had some fabric on hand. And I'm just going to show you some of it I'm going to use. Some of it I may not. Um... She's not, a, she's not a crafty person. She does not collect craft supplies, but I think her mother had these handy and she didn't have it in her to get rid of them. So she showed me these fabric remnants, which, I mean, we don't like them. These are kind of ugly. Um, and I, this piece, I unfolded it. I don't think there's enough of this. I could use this for part of it maybe, like for the first prototype to see, make sure it's working. Maybe. This is some kind of awful polyester stiff, like this is this is not gonna be good apron material. So this will probably just end up in the thrift pile for me. This might be a practice one. Um, this is pretty decent quilting cotton. I don't know where she got it and I think there's probably enough of it. You can see it's like green background, pink roses. Not colors that I see her wearing, but 
again, I don't think she cares about the fabric so much as the fit. And I think she'd rather see this used than not. The other two pieces are kind of interesting. Now you need to understand my in-laws um, lived abroad for about 30 years in Africa. They were in Kenya, then South Africa. That's where my husband grew up. And um, she came back with these pieces of fabric. I think these are from Kenya. And this looks like either a tablecloth, like something you would use as a tablecloth. It's actually hemmed. Or maybe you would make a tunic out of it. Like you could cut, cut that in the middle and put it over your head and make a tunic out of it. So I'm gonna get creative and see if I can figure out how to use this piece of fabric to make one of those aprons. And because it's so patterned, that's gonna be tricky. So this is not gonna be my first one. <laughs> maybe not even the second one. Um, and then there's a, oops, there's another piece also patterned much like that kind of, this has raw edges. So I'm not sure what this was intended for. My issue with this is that it's really, really thin. So as far as aprons go, it would not, I mean, it would take no, like if you spill anything, liquid, whatever, like it would just soak right through. So I'm not sure about this, but if I line it, maybe it'd be too heavy. I'm not sure. So these I'm going to hold off on until I make sure I've got the actual pattern right. So those are the fabrics that she gave me to use. I want to, you know, even though I don't know that these are necessarily the most appropriate um, in terms of like fabric weight, I'm going to respect that and give it my best. I also found, I was digging through my own fabric stash and I don't remember where I got this but I have a really big piece of this. Um, is this cotton and steel? Or no, it's some other brand. I'm sorry, I don't remember, but really big graphic print. This is super cool. Let me turn it right side up. Super cool, has a bunch of animals on it that they saw, like they saw rhinos and elephants and lions and antelope all the time when they lived when they lived in South Africa because you can go to these game reserves and drive around and see them um and this is like a heavier it's sort of a I think it's a linen blend more of not like a heavy canvas weight but more going on and I hopefully there's enough of this um but considering their history there I think I might use this too. We'll see. Anyway, I've got my work cut out for me. I think the biggest chunk of work is going to be to take apart the original and make the pattern, make the prototype and make sure I have like, have the construction figured out and the seam finishing figured out. I do have a serger, which will help. Um, but her birthday, she wants these for her birthday, which isn't until June but they will be coming here next month for a visit because my son is doing a senior cello recital. By the way, I am playing two really big pieces with him on that. So that is a reason that I am very busy these days, um, but they plan to come for that. So it would be nice to have one of these done so she can try it on and make sure that it's working. Um, anyway, <laughs> haven't done anything with that yet, but I've thought a lot about it and obviously went stash hunting to see if I had anything a little more appropriate than than some of the thinner ones she gave me. So anyway, that is all I have for today. I will see you soon. Thanks for joining me.